Hi there, and welcome to the Alberta Update, a look at what's happening in your province and with your government. I am your host, Bruce McAllister. Thank you for being with us uh, today. Coming up, Minister Nathan Newdorf is going to pop by and talk about the cold snap, Alberta's power grid, and energy security, and all the things that we need to know uh, as Albertans. Minister Jason Nixon will be here to talk about the uh, shelter spaces and concerns around the homeless encampments in Edmonton, some of the work the government is doing, plus some big news for Made in Alberta Productions, and we are pleased to have Minister Tanya Fur here to talk about the success during the awards season and what it means for Alberta's film and television television industry, all that and much more coming up in the next half hour or so on the, uh, the Alberta update. Well, Winterly finally showed up in Alberta, didn't it? And it arrived uh, with a bang, some record low temperatures, putting pressure on our electricity grid for sure uh, in the depths of this deep freeze. Alerts from the Alberta Electric uh, Service Operator asked Albertans to reduce their power consumption to prevent uh, strain on the grid. And uh, we were pushing minus 40 temperatures, of course, for a few days. The challenges we faced over the last week really highlight the need to push back against the ideological uh, uh, destination or the ideological uh, push from Ottawa uh, when it comes to net zero and the electricity grid. Uh, Premier Danielle Smith highlighted uh, some of these challenges recently. Here's a listen. Is Canada broken? There seems to be a little bit of that talk online. And when you look at the out of control policies coming out of Ottawa right now, it's not hard to see why some might feel that way. As you know, Alberta is a province of innovators and entrepreneurs. It's something we're known for. And we see that innovation and entrepreneurship all throughout our province and economy from agriculture to energy to manufacturing and technology. We are problem solvers, but it's one thing to solve problems as they come up organically. It's another thing when our federal government is creating problems and refusing to focus on solutions. Let's talk about some of these. Electricity regulations that will erode Canada's power grids and put many Canadians in the dark with utility bills they simply cannot afford. Carbon tax exemptions for one part of the country while the rest of the country keeps on paying. Unachievable emissions reductions targets that will simply put chase tens of thousands of good jobs and billions in investment out of the country and out of Alberta. What's even more bizarre, Ottawa wants to ban gasoline vehicles in Canada in favor of electric vehicles, even though the current infrastructure cannot support this change. And I'm not done yet. Just days ago, the federal Liberals launched their latest so-called great idea, a national plastics registry program, so we can register plastic products, a plan that seems to continue their attack against this industry. Quite simply, this is nonsensical. We rely on plastics in the products we use every day from clothing to sporting equipment to vehicle parts, cell phones and medical equipment. Why does Ottawa think these products are bad? All of these policies and more are designed to hurt everyday Canadians and make life more expensive and more difficult. We have always been a country and a province that offers opportunity and a good quality of life for those willing to put in the effort. That dream is now gravely in jeopardy because of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his Environment Minister Stephen Guibault. At a time when Albertans and Canadians are still struggling with an affordability crisis, they are pursuing policies that will increase costs and put paychecks at risk. At the beginning of 2024, when we should be looking forward with optimism, we're talking about imploding our economy, banning cars, registering plastics, and paying into the carbon tax instead. Well, not all of us. Alberta is fighting back, and we need to fight back, all because of the dangerous ideas of Minister Stephen Guibault. It doesn't matter that he's been told twice by the Supreme Court and the federal court that his ideas are unconstitutional. The rule of law doesn't seem to slow things down. But all of this could stop right now. We could move away from dangerous ideological policies and instead focus on rational solutions for the future. This includes solutions that will help us achieve a realistic goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. And Alberta's committed to that goal. We have billions of dollars of private investment in new technologies that are geared toward eliminating emissions and creating a better future that includes large investment in Alberta over a decade. Dow's Path to Zero project, the world's first net zero plastics manufacturing facility, and another Alberta first, a new net zero hydrogen plant by Air Products. We have and will continue to invest billions into carbon capture projects and programs. The truth is, Ottawa likes to tell all of us what to do when it comes to emissions reduction. And Minister Guibault has even gone to China to do the same. But it's hypocritical. 
The truth is Alberta has met emissions reduction targets, while the federal government has yet to meet a single one of theirs. The truth is we don't need to destroy our economy to achieve a better future. Alberta continues to prove that. And we don't need to work against each other. But as long as Ottawa brings in policies and legislation that hurts Alberta and hurts Canadians, our government will continue to stand up and will continue to fight back. Alberta and Ottawa can have a positive and collaborative relationship, but not with this environment, Minister, and not with these dangerous policies. Albertans can rest assured we will keep on defending the rule of law, the Constitution, the needs of our province, and what's best for you whenever necessary. And we will keep on pressing forward in 2024. And joining us now to talk more about this is the Minister of Affordability and Utilities, and that is uh, Minister Nathan Newdorf. Uh, Minister, thank you for taking the time. Great to be here, Bruce. Appreciate all that you do for us. Well, what a week it has been, hasn't it? Um, I, I know how busy you have been. Uh, what kind of, maybe we'll start with this, what kind of contributing factors led to the uh, the situation uh, with ASO, the emergency alert, asking Albertans to reduce their power, and how did government go about handling it? Sure, you bet. There, there was a lot of factors. I, I like to refer to it as the perfect storm for Alberta. One was just the, the size of the cold front that came down from the north. Uh, encompassing all of Alberta, BC, Saskatchewan, Montana, reaching down south into Idaho, and just causing a huge stress and demand on all of those systems, which led to Alberta not being able to go to our backup reserves, which is typically from BC, Montana, and Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan was able to uh, help us out in a big, big way. But we also had, of course, we're in winter conditions, sun goes down early right before those peak hours, so the solar went off offline just before those uh, the peak began and it wasn't windy or it was too cold for the turbines wind turbines to turn all of the, those leading to uh, heavy reliance on our natural gas generators and we even had two uh, medium-sized natural gas generators that went down due to cold or mechanical issues uh, related to the cold and that put us in a really tough spot and uh, that's what led it to my department working with the premier's office uh, Minister of Public Safety's office uh, on recommendations from the ISO to make sure that Albertans knew uh, the situation and we asked for their help. Well, let's follow up with that for a second. Uh, a tip of the cap to Albertans, they really stood up and reduced consumption when called upon. It, it was amazing. It was absolutely tremendous. The, the time frame, like in less than a minute, 100 megawatts came offline and 100 megawatts would buff, roughly power 120,000 houses, like that's that's a big, big deal. And if you think of people predominantly turning off lights, that might only be half of their energy consumption. So overall, that could have been a half a million homes uh, in, the, in a few minutes doing something to help us lower our load, just amazing. Look, energy security is a, is a huge issue uh, for Albertans. And uh, I think this was probably a wake up call for a lot of people as to, uh, uh, the sensitivity, uh, the vulnerability of our grid, wind and solar, as you said, uh, were offline. What kind of conversations are you having now to to ensure the reliability of the grid? Well, exactly that. Reliability has become more and more important to Albertans and Canadians and for everybody in, in all of North America, truly. So while we love some of the characteristics and attributes of renewables, solar and wind are zero emitting and low cost, those are terrific, they do have limitations. We need that reliability, especially in extreme weather situations like winter, uh, where roving brownouts have very significant and serious consequences. We need to make sure that we have that reliability. So we're looking at natural gas, we're looking at geothermal, we're looking at biomass, we're looking at nuclear technologies and what we can do to make sure that when we have those extreme situations, we have the power that we need to get through them. Yeah, you know, many, many more concerns are being raised, I think, after the situation that we just went through. And um, Ottawa's plan to to force provinces to get to net zero on the electricity get, grid by 2035, uh, to purchase electrical vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, it just never ends, which, of course, would have been a, a major problem to the grid itself during just what we just went through. Do you think this sends a message? Will it help you in your discussions with Ottawa as to the situation here in Alberta? and what we actually have to deal with, what reality is like for us. Well, I don't know what impact it'll have on Ottawa. They, they haven't seemed to listen to reason so far. But what I do think has been very helpful is that everyday Albertans realize 
the real life consequences uh, of the debate that we are having. And we've seen uh, tremendous uh, real life experience lead to understanding, oh, this is what you're talking about. It's not that we don't want to have uh, lower emissions. It's that we want to do it in a practical, re reliable and reasonable way that's not going to cost millions and millions of dollars right out of their pockets in a, an un unreasonable time frame. We want to do it well. We want to take the time that it needs to build a system that they can trust uh, when they really, really need it. And I think that's been one of the, the greatest benefits of going through something like this. Everybody realized their part in this puzzle. Yeah, you bet. Listen, appreciate your work on the file. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, joining us today. Affordability and Utilities Minister Nathan Newdorf. Thanks, Bruce. And those extreme temperatures that we have been dealing with here in Alberta are uh, are causing some serious concerns for the homeless population in our province. Uh, Alberta's government, alongside nonprofit leaders, taking real action in response to homelessness in Edmonton and right across the province. Joining us now to talk more about this is the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services. That is Minister Jason Nixon. Good day, Minister. Good to see you, Bruce. Uh, let's start by talking about the encampments in Edmonton, uh, if we could, and what's been going on there, because it has it has certainly been in the headlines a lot for very good reason. Update us on on what's going on up there. You know, encampments are not different just to the city of Edmonton, but Edmonton's situation is, is significantly worse than other cities because, frankly, it's been allowed to go on for so long. I mean, the, the chief of police recently said there's 14,000 encampment complaints in the city of Edmonton right now. And about a month and a half back, the Chief McPhee, the Chief of the Edmonton Police Service, came and saw the Premier, myself, and a few other cabinet ministers and showed us some of the things that are happening in those encampments. And they're really appalling, Bruce. I mean, people have lost their lives to accidental fires, obviously from them trying to heat their tents during cold temperatures. Uh, there's gang violence taking place inside these encampments. There's been sexual violence. There's been children who have been being trafficked inside those encampments, weapons, and other really serious issues that are taking place there. And, you know, it, it has reached a, a situation where real action needs to be taken by all levels of government uh, to keep people safe that are being victimized within these encampments, but also Emmetonians uh, who are being victimized by these encampments within their communities. All right, we're going to talk about some of that action, some of the things that you've done in just a second, Minister. First, you reference Edmonton Police Chief Dale McPhee. You were at a press conference. He was there yesterday with a ton of stakeholders and very important people sharing your messaging. Uh, let's let's take a quick le listen to what the Chief had to say. Alone we go fast, together we go far. Having our Chiefs at the table, the leadership, the true leadership of First Nations, being the voice of First Nations, who I've worked with for many, many years, having the government and every ministry that needs to be here to create solutions as part of this, having the city workers, the fire department, this is a solvable problem, folks. But it isn't if we continue to let no ruled in camp camping take place in our city where our vulnerable are violated and exposed every day. That was Edmonton Police Chief Dale McPhee uh, with uh, some pretty strong words about pulling together. Uh, so, so, Minister, your reaction to what the police chief had to say? Yeah, and the chief's exactly right. You know, when, when uh, the Premier was made aware of this issue, she immediately brought together uh, relevant ministries, particularly my Ministry of Social Services, to come around the chief and support him. Uh, and one of the key stakeholders as well is, of course, that Indigenous connection. And that's been an important part of our government, important part of the Premier's work and her Minister's work on everything from industry on to social services and everywhere in between. And we've been working really closely with our Indigenous partners when it comes to working with the homeless population. Just recently, we opened up uh, uh, Indigenous-run shelters in all of our major cities, including here where I am today in the city of Edmonton. Uh, and the chief is right. We need to all come together. We need to work to help very vulnerable people who are being impacted, sometimes losing their lives because of the situations taking place around encampments, come forward with concrete solutions. And if we work together, I'm very confident that we're going to help people uh, and we're going to continue to make Edmonton a better place to live. Right. And uh, let's let's clear up a couple other things, Minister, that we hear sometimes that are inaccurate. Uh, number one, there is shelter space. We do have capacity and it is a safer place to be than an encampment. You've just made a financial contribution to help with some of these wraparound supports as well. Yes. 
That's correct. You know, we've we've invested more than any government in history to make sure we have enough emergency capacity in our largest cities for the homeless population. As you know, Bruce, I used to work with the homeless population before I was in government. So this is an area that I'm very familiar with. And I'm proud of our premier. I'm proud of our government uh, that we were able to do that. We have the most shelter space in our largest cities, and we've been able to respond to this emergency in different ways because of that. Uh, and we're going to continue that investment going forward. I also want to make really clear one of the unique things we're doing is we're investing in different types of shelter, which we heard loud and clear that we need to do. Again, having Indigenous run shelters supported by the government, women only spaces, which are other things that have been identified that need to take place on the street. And what we announced yesterday was that we're opening up a new navigation center here in the city of Edmonton that brings all of the resources from the social services sector, as well as the health sector, public safety, and those type of resources and nonprofits together in one location to support anybody who's coming out of the encampments as the police tear them down, to immediately get them access to real concrete, life-changing services. Uh, and we're really excited about what's taking place there. It's only been one day. Over 50% of the people we've interacted with in encampments have taken us up on that opportunity and have moved on already into different type of housing options or addiction support or health support. And I'm looking forward to being able to tell a little more of that story in the coming days as we get more data and a little bit more time under our belt uh, with this new center. Well, we're already, like you said, hearing some some good news stories coming out of the work that you're doing there. So, um, uh, listen, appreciate that. Let's talk about affordable housing for a second, if we could. It it's also a big concern for low income Albertans. Uh, what's your government doing now to to assure that we have enough affordable housing? You know, affordable housing may be the biggest political issue and economic issue in the country. Now, it's a real issue. It's why uh, our government has been very focused on it over the last uh, several years, particularly the last year. You know, we're working through a, a, a plan that we call the Stronger Foundations Plan uh, that will ultimately result in a $9 billion investment, 25,000 more affordable homes going to the market. But the Premier's also been clear that we need to make sure that we're also focused on what we call attainable housing and making sure that outside of the social housing, we're also making sure there's enough housing within our market to make sure that houses are affordable for the average Joe, the average Albertan, uh, and for our kids. Uh, I know it's very important to the Premier and me that we maintain affordability in our market, that the dream of home ownership doesn't go away. And so we're balancing all of those issues. Just a few moments ago, I announced a new senior lodge review, for example, to go through all of our senior lodge assets, which is housing, and make sure that we're keeping care of our seniors through that process. Uh, and we anticipate that we're going to continue to come forward with significant long-term investments in housing. But we're also going to continue to focus on removing red tape, working with our municipalities to make sure that our industry can drive the way and make more houses. And Bruce, I want to say, say this, I'm actually really proud of this. Uh, just before Christmas, we had the largest purpose-built rentals built in the history of the city of Calgary. Uh, Alberta continues to be the only place that is having construction on residential construction advancing at a rapid rate. Nowhere else in the country is that taking place. So our plan is working, and we got a long road to go, as do all jurisdictions. But we got a plan here in Alberta, and ultimately we're going to maintain affordability in our market and make sure Alberta is the best place to live in the country. Well, you've got a lot on your plate, Minister. I know how hard you're running today and uh, during the season. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Thanks for having me on, Bruce. Well, the future of health care is, uh, is being placed in the hands of health care workers and Albertans. As part of the plan to reform the health care system, Alberta's government is launching a series of province-wide in-person engagement sessions to hear from frontline workers, from patients, from families, and from caregivers. Uh, these sessions are an opportunity for open conversations about the challenges, the solutions, and the innovations that will help build a stronger health care system. Uh, your input is crucial uh, to creating a system that serves the, the, the current and future health care needs of Albertans, and you can register for one of these uh, over 40 in-person sessions by visiting alberta.ca slash healthcare. Alberta's government is investing in the future with more than three and a half million dollars to help post-secondaries advance research in technology and in innovation. The funding is part of the Alberta Technology Innovation Strategy and will fund research projects at SAIT as well as NATE and uh, Lethbridge College. Those projects range from advancements in uh, unmanned flight and environmental restoration to developments in energy storage and agriculture technologies. These investments demonstrate the provincial government's commitment to positioning Alberta as a leader in innovation and in engaging technology. Well, some great news for our province. Made in Alberta TV productions are playing a major role in award season this year. Uh, get this, Alberta-based shows received a total of 30 
Emmy Award nominations, and six Golden Globe nominations. Minister of Arts, Culture, and Status of Women, Tanya Furr, is here to talk more about this in a uh, recent trip that, uh, that she had uh, and the future of Alberta film and television industry. Minister, welcome. Great to see you. Great to see you, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Listen, lots of nominations for uh, Alberta Productions this year. Uh, I think it was eight wins for HBO's, HBO's The Last of Us. Uh, how exciting uh, for Alberta. You must be extremely proud and, uh, and probably out there shouting it from the rooftops how well we're doing. Extremely proud is right. Incredible to see between uh, The Last of Us and Prey, 30 total Emmy nominations, as you pointed out, uh, eight wins. What an amazing uh, celebration and good news and, and momentum for Alberta's film and television industry. When we get news like this, what, what, what kind of an impact do you think it will have, Minister, going forward on the, on the movie and the, and the film, the TV industry here in Alberta? Absolutely. I mean, these types of productions, we know what it does for diversifying and strengthening our economy, uh, what it means for tourism to the province. We all know when we see in incredible uh, places on the big screen that it draws in the tourism, but about the jobs and investment, you know, and we funded 267 film and television production since 2020, which has generated $1.2 billion for our economy, 4,000 jobs. Uh, this is this is exciting and this is momentum that we want to see continue. Listen, you recently made a trip to LA to promote the film and TV industry here in Alberta. Uh, I, I would imagine some great things came about that. I guess it's the, uh, the Alberta is calling uh, film edition, if you will. How did it go? What did you learn? It was amazing. It, the the value of these face to face meetings uh, with the, the Hollywood and movie studio executives, um, the return on investment is incredible. It, they, I've heard from them that the face to face meetings matter. The opportunity to meet with um, executives from organizations like HBO, Netflix, Disney, Sony, uh, it's incredible. And one of the things that I heard from them, you know, to quote one of the HBO executives that I met with, is things like increased in investments in incentives like our film and television tax credit have put us, quote, in the major leagues. And there's definitely excitement and, and momentum for more productions to come to Alberta. So what's next uh, going forward? This is a this is a great ministry to be in right now. You get all the good news. And uh, poor, poor Minister Newdorf has been dealing with uh, <laughs> with so much, as you, you heard in our conversation earlier. Uh, what's what's next, Minister Fur, going forward? And uh, what, what kind of things are you working on? Yeah, you're right. I am very lucky to have have this ministry and be, be able to sell Alberta and all we have to offer uh, to the Hollywood executives and worldwide for that matter. A lot of the production companies keep close to their chest future productions until things are confirmed and actually start rolling. But there's so many great things that are out there now or will be coming soon for folks to watch from Heartland to Billy the Kid to Fargo to My Life with the Walter Boys. Um, lots of positivity coming out of these meetings. And uh, now that the strike in the U.S. is over, the writers and actors strike um, is over in the United States, lots of pent up uh, production that needs to be caught up on. It's going to be a very exciting year for Alberta in, in film and television. Oh, we look forward to it. A great news story. Uh, Minister, thank you for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Bruce. Well, since the 1988 Winter Olympics uh, in Calgary, Alberta has built a reputation as a destination for top tier winter sports and activities. And that is why over the next few weeks, Alberta will be uh, welcoming uh, six national and international competitions featuring 800 athletes from more than 25 countries. Alberta's government is supporting these events, which have uh, large economic benefits, of course, uh, for, the, for the entire province by investing a million to support these uh, million dollars to support these competitions. The events include the Ski Cross World Cup, the Cross Country Skiing World Cup, the Snowboard Halfpipe World Cup, the International Speed Skating Championships, the International Biathlon World Cup Final, and the Scotties Tournament of Hearts. All of these world-class sporting events bring enormous benefits to Albertans, from economic growth, expanding tourism, and generating jobs, to lasting uh, the feeling of lasting pride in our province, the athletes and the communities that host these events. It also can leave a legacy of world-class sporting infrastructure that can benefit future generations of Alberta athletes. 
Well, that does it for the Alberta update this week as we take a look at uh, what's happening in your province, what's happening with your government and uh, the issues that impact you. We appreciate you sharing your time with us. You can always view the Alberta update on the Your Alberta YouTube page or the premieres at AB Danielle Smith. Make sure to subscribe by searching Your Alberta or AB Danielle Smith on YouTube and then hit the subscribe button. Thanks again for being with us and we'll see you next time. 